at a dinner party a few years ago when a friend of the host launched into what became an exhaustive tirade about the problem as he saw it with breeders. So in his eyes, couples who opted to have children were selfish, narcissistic, and irresponsible because the earth is overpopulated. And what I remember most about that day was his wife's face turning bright red because about a half hour prior to that, I had confided in, in her that we were expecting. <laughs> now, it's not an opinion I haven't heard before. Many of my friends and academic colleagues vocally opt not to have kids in order to save the planet. So in their eyes, it's a simple input and output equation. More people means more problems. Fortunately, though, this logic is flawed. It takes more than math to understand the mechanisms that shift the balance of life on planet Earth. Now, let me be perfectly clear. The greatest challenges we face globally stem from our current predicament where too many people are squandering ever more limited resources, and climate change exacerbates all of them, tied to food, water, energy, and more. Consider, when I was born in 1980, there were about 4.5 billion people on the planet. By 2050, we should have double that number to about 9 billion people. So Earth is getting increasingly crowded, but a bustling planet isn't necessarily doomed. What matters most is how those billions of people choose to live. Scientific models warning us about the dangers of unchecked population growth have been around for hundreds of years, most notably with Malthus in the 18th century. But the book that sparked ethical questions more recently came in 1968 when Stanford professor Paul Ehrlich penned The Population Bomb, warning us that there would not be enough food for the coming decades. So he predicted that famines in the 1970s would kill hundreds of millions of people, and only stringent birth control measures could be the solution. So The Population Bomb, this book, became a bestseller, and overpopulation was dubbed the top environmental crisis of our time. More and more young couples began to question whether or not they should have children at all. So the good news is these famines didn't quite come to pass. Five decades since uh, this book was published, the population has more than doubled and calories consumed per person has actually increased in the most populous countries like India and China. Thanks to the Green Revolution, we have enough food for everyone, but unfortunately, it doesn't reach everyone. And the Earth's population is anticipated to peak around 10 billion sometime this century before decreasing for the first time in modern history. Fertility rates have actually gone down. Now, I'm not going to suggest that the problems with previous population models stem solely from the fact that they were created by men, <laughs> but what Ehrlich and his predecessors didn't anticipate was that women would make different choices about family when their circumstances changed. So in developed and developing nations, in recent decades, women had more access to an education. They joined the labor force. They also had better access to birth control, making family planning a little easier. And on top of that, scientific innovations like antibiotics and vaccines kept families healthier. And as a result of all these things, all around the world, women started to choose to have fewer children. Fertility rates now are just about 2.5 births per woman and expected to decrease. They remain high in places like Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia, where child mortality remains high and health conditions are poor. But make no mistake, Ehrlich wasn't completely wrong. We face many significant challenges ahead. But what matters most isn't the number of people living on the planet, but how we use resources, both as individuals and as societies. Consider global energy consumption. Now, I moved here last year from Texas, and I can tell you on a per capita basis the average Texan consumes about twice as much energy as the average American. Four times as much energy as the average person living in the UK, 
and about eight times as much energy as the average person living in China. We don't have the same impact all around the world. And of course, those consuming less energy now are going to want to adopt more energy intense technologies. So what we really need to focus on is improving energy efficiency. And hunger is still a tremendous problem. We currently do have enough food to feed everyone, as I said before. And where and when famines do occur, they're largely the result of distributional shortcomings rather than an inadequate food supply. But the Green Revolution will only take us so far. If we're to meet anticipated food demand by 2050, we will have to increase agricultural yield by approximately 70 to 100 percent. That's going to take a lot of science and a lot of research. But there is an area that we can have a tremendously large impact now, and that's limiting the amount of food that we throw away. All of the food you see behind me was thrown away, left behind a supermarket. In the US alone, we throw away about 40% of the food we grow. Let me repeat that. We are throwing away about half of the food that we produce in this country, or 31 million tons of food a year, or 1,400 calories per person per day. We can do a lot to limit what we waste. And with all that food that gets thrown away, we're throwing something more away as well. It takes a huge amount of energy to plant, fertilize, harvest, package, produce, ship, refrigerate, prepare, and ultimately toss this stuff. So with that food, wasted food really is wasted energy. And we also lose something else. With all that food, we throw away a lot of water, our most critical resource as Earth gets hotter and drier. You see, climate change, it doesn't just make temperatures warmer. It makes wet places wetter, it makes storms stormier, and it makes droughts significantly more severe. Water shortages are going to get worse. We know this. But what we can do now is prepare. Scientists are working on developing more drought-tolerant crops that will require less water to grow. And we can also recycle water where possible, so we'll have more to go around if we're smart. What I hope you're hearing is that the answers to many of these challenges lie in science, research, and innovation. But if a nation's priorities can be illustrated by where we spend our tax dollars, we aren't really all that focused on finding solutions. The portion of our federal budget that goes toward research and development, or the science stuff, or a lot of the science stuff, is only a fraction of the total. And it's been decreasing. In the late 1960s, 12% of our federal budget went to research and development. Can anyone guess what that number is today? Just shout something out. You guys are so pessimistic. <laughs> My goodness. No, it's, um, it's unfortunately just 3.4%. So extremely low. But I remain optimistic, and I'm going to tell you why. In my job at the University of Texas at Austin, I collect data on our attitudes about energy and the environment. And over the past few years, I started to notice something. You see, parents are more likely to be concerned about environmental challenges like climate change, as you can see behind me. The orange line represents parents as compared to the general population. Parents are also more likely to say they're willing to change their behavior to be more efficient. In these two examples, it's on purchasing hybrid vehicles or installing solar panels. But you get the point. Now, our poll is weighted to reflect US census demographics, so it should be representative of the nation as a whole. But to be sure, I called friends at several other academic polling institutions around the country and asked them to take a look at parents specifically in their data. And they came back telling me that they were seeing the same things. And while it may sound intuitive that parents feel they have a larger stake in the future and want the best for their families, now we have the data to demonstrate that this is actually true. So when couples, mainly affluent couples in developed nations, opt not to have children for the good of the planet, they may have very good intentions. 
but it doesn't really address the underlying challenges to hunger, poverty, conflict, and climate change. And in the long term, they may actually be less vested in Earth's future as a result. What we need to be doing is shifting our global priorities. We can do this. At this critical point in Earth's history, we get to choose what happens next. And I haven't even addressed things like the conservation of biodiversity or ocean acidification. These are huge challenges, and every single one of them is nuanced. I do not pretend to have all of the solutions, certainly not in 10 or 12 minutes. But if you don't remember anything else that I've said here today, here's the take home. If we can be more efficient and less wasteful while supporting women and families, we will achieve a better and more sustainable future for everyone. And it's okay to have kids. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>